I think that the, the Americans have sprung a very nasty surprise on this government. Harper goes down to Washington, sits with Mr. Obama, all smiles, all fine. Then they wake up Thursday morning discovering that it, this isn't just some senator or congressman saying this. This is the budget of the United States government, right? Uh, and you can't negotiate with people on this basis. We got a nuts in the package here. They keep adding, oh, by the way, you're going to pay for your security when you cross the border. That's unacceptable. That's unacceptable to Canada. If I were in government, I would be absolutely furious. Mr. Harper has been had. The Canadians have been had on this. All right. Well, despite all that talk of a kinder, gentler border, the White House seems set to impose a $5.50 visitor fee on us Canadians arriving by air or by sea. Uh, I guess it's going to raise something like $110 million. On a different matter, the federal government is also contemplating closing a number of underutilized border crossings and reducing the hours of operation to them. To discuss this, we go hill to hill with our experts in Washington and Ottawa. Joining me is Colin Robertson, our Eye on America from Ottawa, and Chris Sand, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, is in D.C. looking back at us. Welcome to you both. Good to be here. I'm going to go to you first, Hi, Chris. Is this just a tax grab and, uh, and oh, the Obama administration is just looking to grab money wherever it can and we're just collateral damage? Well, that's a big part of it. Uh, the U.S. is in a fiscal crunch. All the agencies have a budgetary envelope that the president asked them to work within. They submitted both how they were going to cut spending, but also if they saw an opportunity for revenue, they, they wanted to put that forward, too. And I think DHS looks at this and says, well, traditionally we charge this fee because we've got to inspect people's passports when they get off a plane or a boat. We didn't used to have a passport requirement for Canada, for Mexico, for some of the other countries that are there, at least not for Americans. So there wasn't any need to charge the fee, but now we have the passport requirement. Now we need to send an officer or a staff to do that inspection. Therefore, we got a justification for the fee. We got to recoup this cost. I, I don't think it's meant particularly in a, in a mean way towards Canadians, but DHS is under budget pressure like everybody else, and, and revenue is hard to come by in this town. So I think that's where it's coming from. Now, it's only one short step charging you in cars as well, I'm sure. So, uh, Colin Robertson, is this a sign of any friction between us, or is this just, it's just budget stuff? Don't take it personally. Yeah, Don, this is the, the law of unintended consequences. The budget process in the United States, which started about six months ago, everybody knows they've got huge, massive problems. Uh, the, the net debt for each American is close to $100,000 now and growing. Uh, the Tea Party victory in November really signaled to the President and the Republican Party in the, the House says, we've got to do something about the budget. They've got a couple of big proposals before them, but nobody wants to, to utter the famous TAX word within America, so better to tax those <laughs> from without. So we become as Chris suggests, uh, collateral damage. And that's what I mean by the law of unintended consequences. Despite the, the high rhetoric we saw a couple of weeks ago when the Prime Minister went down to Washington and the launch of this uh, really, I think, quite uh, important initiative, the test, of course, now is to see how that initiative moves along and whether we can actually put guts to it. Uh, but this is just uh, something that came along. They have to find the money, and uh, we become part of the problem. We'll push back. The, the only way we're going to be successful is if we uh, align with uh, Mexico on this one and with uh, find allies in the United States and the tourism industry, uh, the airlines. A lot of a whole lot of Canadians down there right now, and if they stop going, then you're going to see push back the other way. But on our own, very difficult to stop. I was going to say that, Chris, should the Prime Minister pick up the phone and call President Obama and say, hey, <laughs> We want our exemption back, or we'll start charging you guys $5.50 to come into Canada? Well, remember that this is a little bit like the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative because it implies to Americans, too, anybody who is coming in and out of Canada. So we, if you look at the 200 million border crossers we have every year, about three-quarters of those are Canadian, but 25% of them are Americans. So they'll pay when they cross... Uh, when they cross by plane or by cruise ship uh, up the Vancouver coast or the East Coast, just like the Canadians will. And that's going to make it very hard for Canada to argue for special treatment in the sense that we're applying this to ourselves. It's a, it's a user fee for using the border and, and everybody's covered. So I think it'll be very hard. Now, that isn't to say you can't negotiate. And we have this border process now. It's very possible that you'll see a proposal uh, come from Canada that might be attractive. But here's the other thing, and, and I think Colin picked up on this. 
the U.S. budget process is not like the Canadian budget process in that what Obama puts forward to the Congress is kind of a bit of fiction. It's a wish list. But Congress is going to take that, mangle it, spindle it, fold it, mutilate it, and turn out a budget of their own devising, which may or may not include this fee. So the hard thing for the Harper government is do you negotiate with Obama now when he's put this in his notional budget, or do you wait to see what happens in the congressional process, which is hard to negotiate with, as Colin said, but which could give you a very different set of outcomes, and maybe only then, once it's sort of moved through the process a little bit farther, do you see whether you've got a real threat or just a, a risk? Yeah, I mean, let's, I guess we wait and see is probably the best advice on this thing, right? Uh, it's early well, days, actually, yeah. No, I think uh, what we've got to do is we've, we actively have to get out there and make our case and find the allies on the American side. It's, it's We have to always go out there. We now have a signal there, and there will be more stuff coming. There's other legislation within the House to put uh, different kinds of taxes on. There's a tax, for example, on agricultural products that's just stuck for a couple of years. So wait and see won't work for us. What we have to do is get out and actively find allies and make the case to the administration as to why this is going to be harmful. The Prime Minister said in the House of Commons today, and uh, as you saw in the clip you gave from uh, Opposition Leader Ignatieff, that there's actually potential for unity between the parties here, and then we have to take that back to the United States and work particularly at the district level and point out all those snowbirds that are down right now, they should be going in and say, we're not going to come, and if they say this in their districts, I'm sorry, Colin. They're going to go. It's sunshine <laughs> down there, and we got winter up here. Chris, I want to go to you on the other issue that's uh, circulating on the border, and that's the move to close some border stations. Now, you know, the U.S. always seems kind of paranoid about our border anyway. Isn't this just going to spoon feed them some more? Because you know, you're closing border crossings, but the road's still there. You can still cross the border. I think it's going to be tricky, but you know the U.S. has been doing uh, its own review of consolidating, especially rural border crossings. And uh, a couple of years ago, DHS. Now, I guess it was just last year, DHS put forward its strategy for micro ports, so that they would consolidate some of the rural crossings to a single, a little bit more sophisticated facility with a four-person staff and more resources for tough inspections, and only open some of the other crossings, say at harvest time and so on, using electronics to monitor the crossing. So if the U.S. is in a process like that it's not surprising Canada is too and we have to if we're only going to have so much money for the border we're going to have to make sure we spend it wisely so I know it's going to be tough on a lot of communities in Canada and in the US if their border crossing is closed and the nearest ones a hundred miles away um, so we have to be judicious but I think the US is thinking along the same lines and we just have to hope that they match up as far as this goes as we move forward I, I, I was going to say Colin <laughs> you, you can't close a border crossing unless both sides agree right yeah exactly but this makes the case for this initiative beyond the border. What we want to do is take those inspections away from the border and move them back to the point of origin. For example, like we do now, if you go travel by air, you do pre-clearance in Toronto or Ottawa or Vancouver, let's start doing that with goods. In other words, make that border. If we're going to draw a perimeter around North America, which is really the intent, then you, you, you can afford to close the borders. If, if you go to Europe, for example, there's nobody standing at borders because you're cleared as you come in. That's what we've got to be uh, achieving and aiming for, and that will allow us to lift those folks to the border, put them where they should be, inspection points at the manufacturing centers on either side. But it's it's underway. The discussions for what you're talking about, yeah. the continental firmware is already supposedly being thought well, about. Uh, uh, and, and in the that, abstract. That we've got to, in the, I hope more in the abstract. We've got limited time frame to actually do this, but it is doable, and that should be the objective, is to is to achieve that so we do cross and forth the border without having the uh, being inspected. Uh, and well, and one that of the things, the Colin, now, your Nexus cards. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Go ahead Chris. Chris. Oh, I was just going to jump in and repeat because w you're right on trusted traveler cards like Nexus cards. That's an expansion area that the perimeter agreement we heard on February 4th was going to include. So too are joint border crossings where we'll use the same facility like we do in Coot Sweetgrass uh, in Alberta on the Alberta-Montana border or Noyan uh, Alberg which is on the Quebec-Vermont border to sort of consolidate resources and make it a bit more cost effective to run those border posts. They all, uh, the, border, the two leaders want to expand those kind of cost sharing operations where they can to provide better service at a lower fiscal impact which I think is a great idea. All right, Chris Sands in Washington and Colin Robertson here in Ottawa. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, John. When we